Hello. Thank you for joining us for this Preservation Resource Center online class. My name is Nathan Lott. I am Research Director and Advocate at the PRC and very glad to be joined today by um, Lindsay Walsworth, who is an architectural historian and to be sharing some footage by G. Andrew Boyd, who is a professional photographer and a longtime photojournalist with the Times-Picayune. Um, so we're going to be diving into some really fascinating content today, which um, had its genesis um, when I actually met Lindsay at the Association for Preservation Technology conference almost exactly a year ago, and which was featured uh, more recently in the June-July issue of the PRC magazine, Preservation in Print. So if you are a PRC member and you get our magazine more or less monthly, then you may have seen the article um, that Lindsay wrote about the history of our third system forts and uh, my article about my experience paddling out to Fort Pike. Um, if you're not a PRC member, then you missed out on that one, but you don't have to miss out on the next issue. You can go to our website, PRCNO, for Preservation Resource Center New Orleans, .org, and you can join there. I encourage you to do that, to stay in touch, sign up for our emails. If you don't already get them, if you came across this through YouTube or one of our social media channels, we love to have people follow us there, but also would hope you sign up for our emails and become a member because your membership dues help support great content like this. So thanks to everyone who has donated um, their financial resources and to everyone who's donating their time to watch this now. And most especially, I wanna thank our presenter, Lindsay Walsworth, who's donating her time and her uh, knowledge of Louisiana's third system forts. Lindsay is a native of Louisiana, so she grew up uh, visiting these places and they're special to her for that reason. But she also is, as I mentioned, an architectural historian who did her master's work at University of Georgia and wrote a thesis about the third system forts of the Gulf Coast. And so she has uh, a deep knowledge of their history and also the perils they face and what conservation strategies and documentation strategies we might employ now to help uh, extend the life of these historic places and also understand them more completely um, and what they tell us about the history of Louisiana. So um, for those of you who have uh, not met Lindsay, you're in for a real treat and a handful of you may have met her when she worked at the Herman Grima House here in New Orleans. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to her to begin the slideshow and uh, let you know that we'll have interspersed amongst her presentation some videos shot by Andrew Boyd using a drone. And um, those appeared originally at the timespickyunola.com site. And we'll be uh, splicing those in today to get some drone footage of what those forts look like in 2018 when he shot that footage. All right. All right, welcome, Lindsay. Hi. So glad to have you with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, okay, so yes, I wrote my preservation master's thesis on third system forts of the Gulf Coast with a focus on Louisiana's. Um, I did that because I grew up going to these forts. Um, I went to Fort Pike in the fourth grade on a school trip, um, ran all up and down the steps and pretended to shoot cannons. It was a really fun day. Um, I went to Fort Gaines and Fort Morgan on trips to Gulf Shores and Fort Pickens when we went to Pensacola. Um, so they were an important part of my childhood. Um, and when it came time to pick a thesis topic, I wanted something that took me home um, and I wanted something that could address climate change. And I thought and I thought and I thought about it and the forts came back to me. And I thought, gosh, they are right on the water. They weigh a lot. Um, they can't be moved like other historic coastal resources. What is going to happen to these forts? Um, and the more I studied them, 
the more I learned about their value to American history and their place in the front lines of climate change. Um, and it went from a master's thesis topic to something I think about all the time. Um, you know, I defended a while ago, but I'm still studying these sports. Um, so I'm really excited Great. about the interest uh, that we've gotten about them. Um, so when people hear third system, the first thing they ask every single time is what were the other systems? Um, and it's kind of a nebulous answer because the first two were only systems as you look back on them, but the way that they're broken down is the first system were forts used for the Revolutionary War. So they're from 1794 to about 1801, and they were really ad hoc. You know, they sort of noticed weak spots and they built forts predominantly of earth and wood. Some stone and brick is used, but it's not um, across the board. And um, as soon as the war was finished, they were done. Um, many weren't completed ever, um, and they were not maintained. So then we roll into the second system a very short period of time later. Um, they're from 1807 to 1812. And they're kind of the bridge system um, they st definitely still used earth and wood, but they incorporated more brick and stone and they were a little more based in contemporary military theory. But again, many were not finished um, and they were not particularly maintained um, over time. So then we come into the third system. And the third system is significant because it represents the first time that the United States accepted the concept of a permanent military structure. Um, normally, they had relied on militias and um, troops and organizations that just came together in the moment and then dispersed. No permanent funding, nothing like that. Uh, with the third system, they decided that America was really making a good go of things and that international forces might try to mess with that and they needed something more um, cohesive. Um, to protect the nation. And so that's the third system built in direct response to the War of 1812. Um, construction of these forts began in 1816 and lasted until 1867. Um, I chose paintings for this slide because uh, you can find first and second system forts and you can see pictures of them. Some of them are still extant, but a lot of them were updated uh, as part of the third system. So they'll have brick and stone and it's easy to think like, well, it looks just like a third system for it. And that's because it was remade into one. Um, so these are the core features of a third system for it. Um, because they were designed for permanence, you'll see construction that is entirely brick and stone. Um, the walls will sometimes be partially filled with earth or shell tabby, um, other times solid brick. Uh, but and they'll be covered with grass for the what's called the terraplain, the very top, um, but they are forts of brick and stone. Um, the second is that because at this point in history, the Navy was the most active military branch, these forts are always on or near the water because they were planning to repel ships. Um, the third feature is that they were designed in the French style. Um, the French military theorists of the time were developing cutting edge um, walled fort technology, um, which is typically concentric layers of defense. So as the outside falls, the soldiers move inward and defend that. Should that fall, they can move further inward. Um, the fourth feature is that they're often paired. So you'll see um, Pike and Macomb together. You'll see Gaines and Morgan together. And the point of that was that they could cinch narrow places, usually in rivers or in the openings of bays, um, to make sure that a ship couldn't go to the far bank and zip in um, to a target. Um, so Louisiana is home to quite a significant number of forts, not the most in the nation, but pretty close. Uh, but what we do have is the very first third system fort designed and built ever in the whole system. Um, and it is Fort Pike. Um, construction began in 1819, but didn't finish until 1827. And that is because they just kept having hurricanes and yellow fever. Um, it is located at Pass Regalese, um, just northeast of the city. 
um, which is the direct access point to Lake Pontchartrain. And that was the most significant military location in the United States after the War of 1812, because it could get an invading force both to the Port of New Orleans, but also up the river to the American interior. Um, Fort Pike is one of the smallest, but what you learn in third system forts is that it's all about the location. It's not really about the footprint of the fort. So it's tiny, but it was the most important. Um, it was fully garrisoned, had all the cannons it needed, but it really never saw combat. Um, instead, it was predominantly a training facility and a prison um, for a short period of time. It held Seminole Indian and African American uh, people who were being expelled from Florida. Um, it was a training ground for what was then called the colored troops, and those were black troops um, who were trained militarily in the Reconstruction era. Um, they were out of slavery, but they were having a very hard time um, earning enough money to support their families. And the army offered them training and a salary, um, which helped them support their families and uh, move on out of, eventually out of Louisiana. Um, Fort Pike held on after the Civil War. Um, it was a lighthouse for a time being, but it was officially abandoned in the late 19th century and purchased by the state of Louisiana in 1928. It opened six years later as a state park. Um, it's the only of Louisiana's third system forts to become a state park. And it was really popular. Um, I've talked to tons of people who went there um, on school field trips or family vacations. Um, and unfortunately, it was pretty significantly damaged in Hurricane Katrina and then later in Gustav and I believe in Ike. Um, mm. And funding from the state was cut so significantly in 2015 that it closed permanently. Um, it still has a state parks website, but it's not open to the public. Um, and I don't, I've not heard of any plans to open it. Um, I think we have a drone video from Andrew for this. Yeah. Okay, so um, I really love the drone footage because it gives you a view that when you're driving by or when you're on the ground, you just don't see. Um, Fort Pike has a very complex network of outworks. Ah, you can see them here. See, it has a wet moat. It's got what's called demi loons around the front. Um, and that's part of that French military theory, which is uh, based on a military engineer named Vauban. And that's the concentric layers of uh, defensible structures. Wow. Uh, Fort Pike is actually, Fort Pike and Macomb, which I'll talk about in a second, are one of the few third system forts that maintain their original citadel and they did not get the Endicott batteries you'll see in other third system forts, which are giant reinforced concrete um, structures right in the middle um, of the parade that look out of place because they are. Yeah, Lindsay, one thing I noticed, um, you mentioned the uh, oftentimes the forts were paired, and this yes. is the case with Macomb and Pine. Um, and so what you also see in both of those examples is they're at a narrow pass. Right. So there's also a bridge there now. The yeah. same place that makes sense to build the forts to have less water to fire on made sense to build a bridge later. And so um, now there's- Yeah, that's something you'll see actually with a lot of third system forts. They're either- near a current military outpost. So you think about Fort Jackson, mm -hmm. um, it's right there by Chalmette. Um, and then other times they're right at the underside of bridges, uh, because like you said, it's the narrowest point and that is where infrastructure people are always gonna look to put a bridge. Yeah, so it's, um, that's one of the things I learned studying them is that what was strategic in 1816 when they were surveying is strategic in 2020. Yeah. Okay, so we'll hop over to Macomb. Let's see. Cool. 
Cool. All right. So Fort Macomb is Fort Pike's twin. Um, they were designed together. Construction started a little later on Fort Macomb, but they were meant to go together. Now, though they're twins and they are paired in the military sense, um, they are not paired in the narrow channel sense. This one is about seven miles um, southwest of Fort Pike, uh, but they would have been close enough, believe it or not, for the cannon shot to be heard, and that would have been the signal um, for them to work together and to look for enemy ships. Um, so when you look at it, it does look exactly like Fort Pike. Um, it is slightly smaller, only because in the six year or three year gap of construction, um, a little bit of technology improvements in artillery meant that the guns got smaller. Um, and once the guns were smaller, they narrowed those casemates. So the footprint um, of Fort Macomb is a little bit smaller. Um, Macomb did not see combat. Um, Fort Pike had a little skirmish. Macomb had nothing. Um, they just, the Confederate soldiers just abandoned it and Union soldiers took it. Um, it was also a training facility and it is uh, pretty well known for having been the location where the future president, Zachary Taylor, was a general for a short period of time, and the 20th Infantry of the Corps d'Afrique, another colored troops um, troop, was there uh, training. It was abandoned in the late 1800s and eventually sort of tied up in a weird property dispute. It had been um, a cow pasture. And there were some property uh, issues for a very long time until Louisiana was able to purchase it in 1927. Um, even though they owned it, they never made it a state park. It's never been open to the public. Um, I was able to access it uh, with, a, with the park ranger from Fort Pike who brought me and let me in. But um, other than that, I, I don't think people are given access very frequently. Um, and there are no plans to open it or make it a state park. Despite the fact that it is the closest to Metro New Orleans. I yeah. know, it's very frustrating. It is the closest and it did not suffer the same um, structural damage that Pike did during Katrina. So the vegetative overgrowth on Macomb is intense and it is absolutely damaging the masonry yeah. but in many ways it's kind of held it down <laughs> and held certain things together so the preservation potential of macomb is as good as pike in a different way um, and so i think it would be really exciting you know for one or both to get the preservation attention that they need because i think they would be a wonderful tandem park Yeah, you can see on that map the proximity to Venetian Isles right there. Wow, that's more overgrown even than when I was there. Yeah, very green.
So those are the two that are in Orleans Parish, but uh, now we'll move to a couple that are not very far away. Yeah, not far at all. Um, so if you just keep heading south, uh, when you get to Lake Bourne near Shell Beach um, is Fort Proctor. And Fort Proctor is, um, so I, I always find that it seems to be people's favorite. And I think that's because it's sort of enchanting out there. Um, it's very beautiful to look at. It's sitting in ruins, uh, kind of looks like a castle. Uh, but the funny thing about Fort Proctor is that it's actually not a fort. Um, it's part of the third system, but it was built as a subsidiary structure, um, which it, it kind of is semantics, but um, it was lesser staffed, lesser armed, and it sat at what was considered a minor access point. So an invading force might come through Lake Bourne, so Fort Proctor was put there. Um, it began late in the third system campaign, so it was not constructed until 1856. And once the war started, they, it never got finished. Um, its original plans um, were for a three-story structure, um, I believe, with an inner and outer moat, drawbridges, its own battery. Um, it never got to that. Um, one of the very interesting things about Fort Proctor is its use of structural iron. Um, that seems way more modern than 1856, mostly because those beams have been made to look like steel. Um, and steel construction, it existed in 1856, uh, but it would have been very cutting edge and unusual. Um, and in fact, those are not steel, they are iron. Hmm. Um, I am not, I don't know that any of them have been replaced or improved because iron left out there on the water for so long uh, seems crazy to me, but um, I couldn't find anything about them having been replaced. So I have to assume that the bulk of them are original. Um, Fort Proctor was sold into private ownership in 1916. Um, and it's obviously never been operated as any sort of park. It's never been officially open for visitors. It is popular with um, kayakers uh, because you can get out there um, and paddle around, but um, it's never been um, intentionally interpreted or visited in any way. Um, one of the other things about Fort Proctor um, that really fed into my thesis is that it was originally not in the middle of the lake like that. There was land all around it. Um, it the water crept in incrementally as it does in South Louisiana, uh, but what really sealed the deal on Fort Proctor being um, surrounded by water was the creation of the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet channel in the 60s, I believe. Um, after that, the water just rushed in. Um, I believe there was land access to Fort Proctor before Katrina, maybe, uh, but now the only way is that riprap barrier that you see very nicely um, in this video and um, obviously by kayak. When was the riprap barrier constructed? Do you know? I think 2008, but I would have to, I'd have to confirm that. Excellent. Yeah. To your point, 150 feet inland, it says. Yeah. I mean, significant. That surprised me a lot when I first read it. I, I had no, I had no idea. Yeah. And there the, uh, MRGO, Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, in the background of that last shot, uh, which many people will know is the Hurricane Superhighway that uh, allowed a lot of storm surge into the city during Hurricane Katrina, or at least certainly into St. Bernard Parish.
All right, so continuing south, we get to Fort Jackson. Um, that's usually um, a, a real favorite among people as well. Um, I think for a lot of reasons, but being a star fort is always pretty charming and it is Louisiana's only uh, star fort. It is located at a bend in the river where soldiers from Fort St. Philip, which is directly across on the East Bank, um, were able to repel British ships um, before the Battle of New Orleans. So obviously very strategic militarily and because third system forts love to prepare forts to cinch off those places, Fort Jackson was built on the West Bank and it was named for Andrew Jackson. And in addition to being our only star fort, it is probably the most Vauban of all the Vauban designs in that it's the only fort in the third system that uses what are called cavaliered bastions. So the five points of the star that you see are the bastions. And instead of being properly connected to everything else, there are actually dividers in there. And so if the entire fort fell, the soldiers could all get into one or more of the bastions and defend them as independent tiny forts, um, which is pretty cool, but obviously not something they replicated anywhere else. Uh, fort Jackson saw more combat than any other Louisiana fort. Um, it had 10 days of heavy bombardment from Union soldiers. Um, in the end, the Confederate soldiers fled. It's too much for them. Um, and the Union Army took it. Um, there's a map of the damage that's very interesting. Um, it was held by the Union Army for a little while, uh, but then pretty quickly decommissioned, like, I mean, you know, within a decade, decommissioned um, and sold into private ownership. Um, the land that the fort sits on and the fort itself were donated to Plaquemine Parish, and it was operated as a parish park uh, for many, many decades. Um, I met tons of people who went there as children and had barbecues on the 4th of July and things at, at Fort Jackson. Um, it was very, very heavily damaged in Katrina um, and the damage was structural. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, it was because of the foundation system and it's just not safe enough to be open to the public uh, regularly. So it is currently closed. Um, there are always plans on deck um, when the funding comes through to improve it and open it, but for now it is closed. Sorry. All right. They beat me to it. <laughs> Some large trees growing at the entrance. Yes, it is covered in oak trees. Um, oh, there's the damage map. Gosh, Andrew, great videos. Um, yeah, it is covered in trees. Um, the day that I was there, um, the first time I ever visited for research, they were um, chopping some down and airlifting them by helicopter out. Wow. It was wild, um, but it's the only way that they can get the weight of those trees off without putting too much weight on the walls of the fort. It was cool. Wow. And that's the Mississippi River that we see in the background. Yeah. So uh, is this the only one of the third system that was built on the river as opposed to oh, estuary? You're right. Yeah, it is. Interesting. And the, were the concrete additions later? Yes, those are called Endicott barriers and they are done um, later in 
what was called the Endicott system. Um, and it was predominantly reinforcing old, old forts um, for assaults by air. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, okay, so we've done Orleans, uh, St. Bernard, and Plaquemine. Where are yeah. we headed now? Um, here we are at Fort Livingston on Ile Grand Terre. Um, the third system is known as the coastal system. And the funny thing about Louisiana is that we have all that coast. <laughs> um, but Fort Livingston is actually the only truly coastal fort um, that we have. And it was the very last third system fort built in Louisiana. Um, originally, it was a triplet to Pike and Macomb, so it was going to be another little slice of pie shaped fort, um, but construction kept being delayed, mostly because of hurricanes, um, and it got pushed out so far that technology improved and the design was reworked as trapezoidal or kite shaped, which we'll see in another fort. Um, and when it was constructed, it was entirely on land. Um, but as you can see from the background aerial of this slide, um, it is falling into the water, has been for decades. Um, it actually was so damaged by hurricanes um, from day one that it started fall. It was lost to sea level rise while they were building it. Um, it just kind of didn't stand a chance. Um, it is Thought to, be, thought to have been constructed on a Native American midden uh, because there are shells and pottery fragments both in the ground around Fort Livingston and in the tabby that is used uh, between the walls, between the bricks of the wall. Um, it, oh gosh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it never saw combat. Uh, nobody ever got over there in the Civil War. Um, so it was really just a cleanup site for most of its active years. Um, it was garrisoned, but nothing, nothing really ever came of it. Um, they abandoned it in 1892, um, which I learned is the official military term for no longer using a structure. Uh, they didn't just walk out one day. Um, it's official abandonment. Um, and it was given to the state in 1923. Um, so the island that is on is a wildlife and fisheries protected area. Um, so state funding is going to the island, and you'll see that in the riprap barrier. Um, there is some sand replenishment, I believe, uh, but it's not a state park. It was never operated as one, um, and though you can take a boat out to it, it is not at all encouraged as a, a visitor location. It's not interpreted. Yeah, and I don't think we have a, a drone video for that. No, I don't think so. That was one he couldn't get out to. Um, although I might see if he ever wants to do a boat together out there, because it's one of the ones I haven't gotten to either. Um, I'd really like to see it. Uh, so part of my research um, was comparing Louisiana's forts to other forts. Um, very conveniently, there are a ton of them across the Gulf Coast. Um, so they were very close. And um, there are forts in Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. Um, those were the ones I studied. You can go, obviously, all the way up the East Coast and study them, but um, that wasn't relevant to uh, my frame within the thesis. Um, so the other ones I studied are Fort Massachusetts, which is on Ship Island in Mississippi. And though it is a Mississippi fort, it was actually part of the network of forts intended to defend New Orleans. Um, so it would have been the very first fort an invading force would have come across um, on their way to Pastor Galese trying to get into Pontchartrain. Um, it was constructed from 1859 to 1861, not really a lot of combat, and it is open to the public and very well visited. Uh, moving eastward is Fort Gaines on Dauphin Island, um, built from 1821 to 1861. It's a really long period of time, um, and that is mostly due to funding issues and constant hurricanes. 
Um, it absolutely saw combat in the Civil War, um, and it is currently operated as a park and open to the public. Um, continuing east is Fort Morgan, and it is the pair of, uh, with Fort Gaines, so they cinch off uh, Mobile Bay. And it was constructed from 1819 to 1834, also saw combat, and it is operated as a park and open to the public. Um, and then you get to Pensacola Bay, which has its two, um, and they are Fort Pickens, built from 1829 to 1834. Um, and what I learned studying is that a lot of historians believe that the first shot of the Civil War actually took place at Fort Pickens rather than Fort Sumter. Um, it's highly debated, but supposedly by a couple of hours, <laughs> the first shot might have been at Fort Pickens. Um, it is also a park that is open to the public. And the final one is Fort Barrancas, and that is a trapezoidal, so kite-shaped. This is probably what Livingston would have looked like on more stable ground. Um, it was built on the site of a previous Spanish fort, and at the bottom of the picture, you see that little semicircle uh, building. That is a water battery from the original Spanish fort, just called Spanish Water Battery. Um, but it is also a park and is open to the public. So when I visited all the forts, um, I noticed that outside of the obvious public access issues, it's very hard to get to Louisiana's, um, the ones in the other states were so much better cared for. They're in better shape, they're full of people, they're advertised. Um, and so I thought, gosh, why are Louisiana's doing so poorly when ones so close by are doing really well? Um, and what I discovered was that it's sort of overlapping problems that are somewhat unique to Louisiana. Um, the first is Louisiana's geology. The second is our location on the Gulf. And the third is a lack of funding and management for the forts. Um, so looking at geology, um, the real core of it is the river. Um, because the Mississippi River is a long and slow moving river, um, for thousands of years, the silt that it collects from um, Canada and the bulk of the United States um, filters down to Louisiana, causes the river to flood, sending that silt everywhere. Um, sometimes it fills up so much that the river changes course. And what that means over thousands and thousands of years is that Louisiana was built up by that alluvial soil. So by all that silt spilling over and over and over. Um, and that's part of what makes Louisiana so beautiful because that nutrient rich silty soil is what feeds wetlands. It's why we have cypress forests that everybody likes um, to look at. Um, but it also means that the ground is very soft and squishy. Um, so building uh, foundations that work in other firmer soil types, they're not gonna work in Louisiana. It's just too soft. Um, the other problem is that the particles of alluvial soil are much, much finer than those of other soil types. So through currents, storm surge, um, any form of erosion, they wash away at a rate other soil types simply don't. Um, so what you've got is big, heavy buildings sitting on soft, squishy soil that likes to wash away. Um, if you look at barrier islands, so Mississippi, um, the Dauphin Island, Pensacola, uh, well, Santa Rosa, they're on really firm sand. It doesn't seem like that would make a huge difference because you think, well, gosh, sand also washes away. Uh, but it just simply doesn't behave the same way that um, silty alluvial soil does. So the solution for Louisiana's forts, um, and that is Pike, Macomb, and Jackson, they all share the same foundation, is what's called grillage. Um, and interestingly, it's actually the same foundation that a lot of the first skyscrapers in Chicago used because they also have very swampy soil. Uh, but the way grillage works is 
it's a grid, really, um, two different overlapping layers of cypress in Louisiana's case, um, cypress logs laid down kind of like a raft, like a really big raft. Um, and then the uh, footing of the forts is built on that. So the stability is coming from the grillage and it allows the compressive weight of the fort to be thrust really evenly and broadly across our soft alluvial soil. And that is how they were able to build these massive, massive structures on really subpar um, soils. Uh, but it's part of the reason that they are suffering significant structural damage in ways that forts to the east of us aren't. Um, and I'll come back to it in just a second. Um, the other issue Louisiana faces that other states don't quite get as much of um, is our location on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we're at about 30 degrees latitude, um, so the water is warmer for longer. Now that's the whole Gulf, it's not just Louisiana. Um, and of course hurricanes, they hit Pensacola, they hit Dauphin Island. Um, but they do seem to hit Louisiana more than um, our neighbors. And that is because there is what's called a loop current in the Gulf of Mexico, where in warm months, a little strip of current, really warm water, moves up like a ribbon from the Yucatan Peninsula up into the Gulf and then under Florida. Um, you can see in this graphic. And sometimes as it moves, it sort of clips at the top and what's called an eddy or just a loop of warm rotating water spins off. And what that does is create sort of a fuel source for hurricanes that might be in the area. Um, and both Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita passed over an eddy in 2005 before making landfall. Um, and the way that the currents of the Gulf of Mexico work, they just seem to head toward Louisiana more than they head toward other, other states. Um, and that puts our forts at a unique risk level uh, for hurricane damage. Wow. Um, so Louisiana had natural protection for a very long time. Um, that alluvial soil we just talked about uh, fed the wetlands, fed the cypress forests. But um, once those were kind of in the way of industry, uh, they got cleared out. So there was serious deforestation of the cypress forests and serious wetlands loss from canal dredging. Uh, so this is a healthy Louisiana wetland. Um, it's very dense. Um, you don't see this much anymore, uh, but that would be difficult to navigate. And if you imagine storm surge flowing over it, you have to think that it would, it would slow it down. Um, but what we have increasingly are wetlands like this, uh, where they have been dredged um, predominantly for uh, transporting petroleum from offshore oil rigs, but other industries as well. Um, and there's just nothing to stop um, or slow down an oncoming storm. Um, so what that means is that powerful storms that might have lessened across miles of healthy wetland are now able to come right to occupied, developed parts of South Louisiana. Um, and our forts, which granted never had too much of a buffer, um, now have virtually no buffer at all. Um, so when that surge rolls in um, and a fort sits on a grillage foundation, what happens, and you'll see it particularly in both Pike and Jackson, is that the entire fort lifted up because that foundation really does operate kind of like a raft. Um, so it lifted up and then dropped down. And of course it didn't drop evenly. Uh, so you'll see catastrophic cracks, particularly in the bastions. Um, they are the weak point. Um, so Fort Pikes looks quite, quite bad. 
Um, and you can see Fort Jackson, and these cracks are at just about all the bastions uh, there. Uh, Fort Livingston uh, is not on grillage, but it is facing uh, just regular conventional erosion and repeated storm impact. So you can see how much the water has encroached on what was originally um, healthy beach. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that is different for Louisiana's forts is that there's not really cohesion in how they are owned, funded, or managed. Um, so when I looked at other states' forts, I thought, you know, who's in charge of these? How are they keeping them um, so well maintained and so well preserved? Um, and what I found is that forts Pickens and Barrancas at Pensacola Bay and Fort Massachusetts on Ship Island in Mississippi are part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore. So they are owned and operated by the National Park Service. Um, that ensures that they have federal funding, that environmental protection is part of the core mission, and they follow strict adherence to the Secretary of the Interior standards. Um, all three forts are open every single day. Um, they receive extremely high quality stewardship and preservation, and they are interpreted in a way that is interesting to people of all walks of life. Um, I've seen children there having a great time, their parents, their grandparents. Um, there's something for everyone because they've interpreted it extremely well. Um, so then I looked at Fort Gaines and it is owned and managed by the local park and beach board. And because their core mission is to promote tourism and to protect the natural environment, uh, you know, by their very existence, they are supporting Fort Gaines because they are ensuring that the land around it is as environmentally stable as it can be. They replant marsh grass, they put out a little bit of riprap and they do sand replenishment so that the beach is enough to keep um, wave erosion away from the bricks of Fort Gaines. Um, they do charge a nominal entry fee and that funds Fort Gaines. Um, they also are a 501c3 that accepts donations and all that money goes directly, uh, well not all of it, but uh, some of that money goes directly to um, preserving Fort Gaines. It also has interpretation. Um, I believe they even do um, historical reenactments there on a somewhat regular basis. Um, so they're definitely drawing people in and focusing attention on Fort Gaines. Um, and then there's Fort Morgan, which is owned and managed by the Alabama Historical Commission, um, a subset of their State Historic Preservation Office. And they are also an entity with a mission to preserve. So Fort Morgan is very well interpreted. It gets state funding. There is a fee um, to access the fort um, and that ensures high quality preservation um, of both the fort and the surrounding area. Um, there is beach replenishment, dune protection and marsh grass uh, replacement there as well. So then you look at Louisiana and it's, you know, it's a single state, but there's no single way that these forts are done. Um, fort Pike is the only, only part or only uh, fort that has ever been operated as a state park. Um, it was very popular, but um, funding was cut in 2015 and no one's really made an effort um, to bring that back. So then you have forts that are state owned, but not state parks. And that would be Fort Macomb and Fort Livingston. Um, both of them have been state owned now for nearly a hundred years, uh, but never open to the public and never interpreted or any sort of active preservation plan. Fort Jackson is owned and managed by Plaquemine Parish. And for a long time, I think it was the strongest um, fort uh, park that Louisiana had to offer. It was very well interpreted. It was well-funded. Um, it was 
really, really well done considering it was, you know, parish rather than National Park Service or a state park. They were doing a great, great job. Um, Hurricane Katrina threw that all off um, and it was, the repairs necessary are just beyond the scope of what a parish can fund. So unless money can come from another avenue, I, I don't see how uh, Fort Jackson can, can go back into being an open uh, public park. And then we've got private ownership. Um, Fort Proctor is actually very hard to research <laughs> who owns Fort Proctor. Um, it was sold into private ownership in the early 20th century and I have no evidence that it ever left private ownership. Um, but it is, it does not exist on a tax parcel uh, and no one can confirm actually. I, I assume it is still privately owned and not parish owned, but I, I really couldn't find anything. Uh, but either way, it's never been advertised um, as a tourist um, attraction. It's not interpreted. They do not encourage visitors. Um, you can obviously kayak there. Many, many people do it, uh, but that is not uh, encouraged by any official entity. Okay, so if our geology um, and our location on the Gulf and our funding <laughs> are all problems, uh, what do we do for these forts? Because people really love them. Um, they want them to be uh, better cared for. And I think that much like we have overlapping problems, we have to look at overlapping solutions. Um, so what I identified are innovative policies and increased funding for the forts, strategic hands-on preservation, and large-scale structural and environmental protections. So if we think about innovative policies, um, looking at other forts policies um, and funding and management um, is a good place to start. And because Barrancas, Pickens, and Massachusetts are all part of the Gulf Islands National Seashore, um, I started there. And what you can see from this map is that the Gulf Islands National Seashore, it's not a continuous line across the Gulf. Um, you know, it picks up, drops off, picks back up, um, and ends actually just before the Louisiana state line. Um, and so what that showed me was that you didn't have to have a park um, or area that was continuous. You know, you could make a system, much like the forts, um, out of things that weren't geographically as near as you might consider um, a traditional national or state park. So then I thought, well, gosh, how could we make this um, really specific to Louisiana? Turns out we are already doing it in a really successful way, and that is the Atchafalaya National Heritage Area. Um, this area is part of the National Park Service. Uh, it receives federal and state funding in addition to nonprofit 501c3 funding. Um, and it does that through multi-agency cooperation. Um, so it has several stakeholders who come together for the uh, preservation, um, tourism, environmental stewardship, and thoughtful, culturally appropriate interpretation of the Atchafalaya area. So we can't really hop on to that. You know, the forts are not in the Atchafalaya Basin. Um, but if we use that model to create some sort of um, heritage area specific to Louisiana's forts um, and brought in multiple stakeholders, um, all of whom, you know, have an interest uh, in preserving the forts, it's an interesting concept uh, that could work for drawing a little bit more attention and a little bit more money um, for Louisiana's forts. Okay, so strategic hands-on preservation. So when you look at Fort Pike or Fort Livingston, you know, repointing the brick is not the answer. Uh, that's just not going to be uh, what they need. But it doesn't mean that there are no options for preserving the forts. Um, so I have a preservation plan done by Lad Ellinger. I don't know if it's in the works anymore, but there were some really, really smart ideas that I'll um, go through. Uh, the first one, which surprised me uh, the most, was to 
go into the walls of the forts and just take out a ton of bricks. Um, because in many places, these walls are up to 20 feet thick of just bricks and tabby. And the compressive weight of that is astronomical. And so if you could support the inner and outer sections of walls and hollow out the centers and then fill it back with structural foam, you could lighten these structures significantly so that they wouldn't be pressing, pressing, pressing into that alluvial soil and they wouldn't be taxing the grillage foundation as much as they do now. Um, I thought that was wild. And the upside of doing that is that when you remove those interior bricks, you have a huge supply of historic brick. So any sort of exterior brick repair can be done with bricks original to the fort. Uh, granted, you're going to see changes in mortar, but it, it's so amazing that you'd be able to repair them with the bricks they were built with originally. Um, I just think it's, it's wild. Um, and then there are more obvious things, you know, building taller, stronger breakwaters, uh, pumping out water from the wet moats if you need to keep um, that water off the very permeable uh, bricks and mortar at the base. Um, but, you know, there are people out there coming up with really cool ways um, to make these forts more preservable uh, than, you know, conventional, let's just fix this, that mortar kind of stuff. Um, it was, it was really interesting. Um, I also learned that you can repair grillage foundation. I assumed it was, you know, too heavy and in too much uh, goopy soil, but um, it is possible to repair those foundations. Uh, so there's hope. Wow. Um, yeah, the, the third piece of the preservation puzzle on these um, is a combination of structural and environmental protections. Um, the structural protections, uh, I feel like probably everyone in New Orleans is extremely familiar with. Um, walls, gates, levees, things that are meant to keep out the storm surge. Um, the problem with this for Louisiana's forts um, is that only one of them is within these, uh, these walls. So only Fort Macomb is inside of the protective structural barrier. And since it doesn't make sense to build um, a wall in the marsh, um, which is actually, you know, intended to uh, have water in it, um, what might be more functional for Louisiana's forts are the environmental um, improvements. Uh, so shoreline protection, um, marsh creation, sediment diversion, which is um, really exciting because it has the potential to sort of reinvigorate the wetlands and give them uh, the nutrient rich silt that they need to um, to grow more grasses and grow more plants, um, filling out the areas uh, that are so, so, so empty right now. Um, none of this is fast. So, you know, we'd have to um, start it now and hope that in 50 years <laughs> it worked uh, and could, you know, build a natural barrier for the forts, which is why it's, it's an overlapping issue. Uh, no one of these is going to preserve them, but I, I really do think that if they had more money, if more people visited them, if they were structurally made sound, and in time, their natural protective environments were able to grow around them. Our third system forts could be around for many, many, many future generations. Um, they're, they're very strong buildings and they've, they've been holding on now, you know, almost 200 years, some of them, they can do it. Uh, we just, we have to help. Oh, that's really great, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Um, sure. Yeah, it, it occurs to me that in addition to being places where we can interpret this sort of layered history that you laid out so well, going back to Indian shell middens or Native American middens and colonial and early American military history and then Indian Removal Act and the Buffalo Soldiers and the U.S. troops who were uh, people of color, you know, all of those layers and then the people who have gone there in the 20th century um, 
as picnickers and, and school children, mm -hmm. you know, that these more recent layers, uh, you know, all of those stories can be told at these places. And in addition to that, the story you just concluded with of, you know, our dire need for coastal restoration and how important, you know, these estuarine systems are and how important it is to restore wetlands to continue to have a viable uh, culture here in Southeast Louisiana. You know, these places could also serve to help educate about ecological as well exactly. as cultural issues. They're really at that juncture. Yeah, and that's one of the things I discovered um, researching them. You know, I, I went in thinking they would only tell the story of America's military history, and I just keep learning more. Um, and I want other people to be able to learn more through them as well. So I'm very excited um, that you invited me to do this. Um, I'm always happy to talk to people about forests. <laughs> Well, we're glad that you you've done so. And so these are a few more places for people that are wanting yeah. To you know, if if someone was particularly interested in something, um, my New Orleans specific research definitely started with Codman Parkerson's book. Um, in the Fort community, everybody knows it, uh, but I I know that that's not a broad community, so I thought I would share it. Um, it's out of print, but it's not difficult to find. Um, and then I included some websites for um, the Gulf Islands National Seashore, for the Atchafalaya Heritage Area, um, Fort Gaines, Fort Morgan. Um, and then what I consider to be probably the most significant um, resource, and that is Louisiana's Coastal Master Plan. Um, you can see all um, of the plans dating back many years at this point, um, but the 2017 is the one that they are working from and the 2023 plan is the one they are working on. And what's exciting about them is that they take into account public opinion. So if you read the plan, um, past plans, future plan, and there's something that doesn't stick right with you or you have an idea that they haven't covered, um, reach out. They are interested to learn. They are pulling in a ton of environmental and cultural resources that weren't considered originally. And so if you have an idea, um, absolutely send it their way. Um, it could get in the plan and it could help save something. That's great. Yeah, you know, anytime we're dealing with infrastructure, it has the potential to either help or hurt. And, you know, this is infrastructure that's intended yeah. to safeguard our coast, but, you know, put the wrong flood wall on the wrong place and you could wind up, you know, destroying a cemetery or destroying exactly. a piece of cultural resource that you didn't know was there. Um, exactly. Um, yeah, local knowledge of things like that is priceless. Um, I work in infrastructure and I promise we want to do the best. Uh, that is always the goal. And then sometimes you go out to the location and are surprised uh, that nobody knew a very significant resource was there. So if you have information about something, send that up. <laughs> we want to know about it. Great. But um, I think we've got time for a few questions, if that's all right, if you're game. Oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, so your uh, presentation about the grill grillage was really interesting. Do you have any idea how many cypress logs were needed, board feet of uh, logs, trees were felled to build one of those forts? I wish. That is something I looked up and I could not find it. Um, I... I really tried everywhere. And then I tried just the diameter of an average uh, fully mature cypress tree times how wide the fort is. And um, because I am not an engineer and I have no idea how much wider than the fort that foundation might be, um, no, but that is something I would actually really love to know. Yeah. Um, you know, one of those resources that once upon a time seemed so plentiful yeah. In New Orleans until it was almost all logged down. Almost all gone, yeah. Um, and uh, tell us a little bit more about the, the masonry, the bond work and, and the brickwork. It seems so tightly done and professionally done. Yes. Um, um, you know, yeah, the brickwork in the fort, it's beautiful. Um, so 
Third system forts were all constructed, um, at least began construction prior to the Civil War. So many of those in the South, including I believe all uh, constructed in Louisiana, um, and actually potentially uh, the rest of the Gulf Coast were constructed in part um, with enslaved labor. Um, so there were paid workers and then enslaved workers uh, working side by side through all phases of construction. Um, something people are often surprised to learn is that many enslaved people were highly trained, highly skilled craftsmen. So it was not unusual to have a master mason who was also an enslaved worker. Um, and so when you look at the masonry in the forts, it's phenomenal. Um, I've actually toured, um, it was Fort Pickens, with a mason who just kept running around like a little kid in a candy store because it was a quality he had never seen before and skills he didn't know um, how to do. Uh, he, he studied them for hours <laughs> trying to figure out how to replicate it. Um, and yeah, it would have been done by um, a combination of enslaved and paid workers. Um, and the, the fact that they are still standing with perfect joinery uh, today is a real testament to what those men could do um, because I, I, I don't know that it could be replicated. That's fascinating. Um, yeah, we talk about just in looking at uh, houses, whether they're contributing elements in our historic mm -hmm. district, you know, how hard would it be to replicate today is a right. question that our local historic district commission asks every time they look at a house that's proposed for some sort of change. And this is a great example of something that would be extraordinarily difficult to recreate just the scale of these, you know, cultural resources, um, not to mention the craftsmanship. Yeah. Uh, the, the bricks themselves, were they? Oh, yes. Um, right. They are local predominantly. I mean, they might have come regionally, but um, for Fort Pike, they were from a um, brick maker on the Chifuncta River, I believe. Um, many are stamped with St. Joe, um, which I think everybody's pretty familiar with. Um, so yeah, they are um, always relatively local because they would have been so heavy uh, and difficult to transport. Yeah, and people probably are aware of you know, the challenge of efflorescence that afflicts old bricks throughout New Orleans, especially in the oldest areas like the French Quarter, you know, rising damp and salts yeah. that crystallize and damage the brick. So obviously these bricks are in a very salty environment. Yeah. Is that one of the afflictions? It is. Um, if you go to the more truly beach coastal forts, uh, particularly Pickens um, and Morgan, you can see the calcium just weeping out. I mean, entire sheets of perfectly smooth calcium that has just been pulled uh, from both the mortar and the bricks. Um, and it, it's also present in Louisiana's forts lesser, uh, to a lesser extent because the salinity of the water that our forts are in is, is lower. Uh, but yes, it is an issue. Um, and that can be treated um, with things like surface poultices that actually pull the salt out. Um, repointing replenishes it through the mortar. Um, there are solutions, uh, but yeah, it is a it is large scale decalcification and efflorescence um, that I believe the National Park Service um, made a case study at Pickens um, for how to how to deal with it. Yeah, that's a, a great point. You know, to have the Gulf Islands National Seashore relatively close by. Um, as you pointed out, something to learn from, an example to study. I know the Park Service has been doing uh, climate change vulnerability assessments for many of its coastal assets. Do you know if they've done that for Gulf Islands or for any of their uh, forts, military installations? Um, if they have, it has been after I wrote <laughs> my thesis. Sure. Um, I definitely came across a handful of um, climate change oriented potential projects, um, predominantly dune preservation and mm -hmm. um, other things like that, um, broken down into the, you know, the no build and the invasive, less invasive. Um, but no, in terms of uh, climate change specific to uh, the forts, sorry. No, no, well, it really is an ongoing effort. Um, so it's entirely possible that they have not really focused on these assets yet. 
Um, but you know, certainly I think having the park service at least say climate change is real and we need to prepare for it. It's affecting our parks now, you know, is uh, something for us to follow and look at that example and, um, you know, returning back to Louisiana and thinking about how we manage these assets and having this dispersed management that you were talking about. Um, it strikes me as really ironic that, you know, we have such a robust tourism economy. I know. And a, you know, so many actors in the tourism space, um, including the Lieutenant Governor's Office and uh, New Orleans and Company and others. Uh, but these haven't been recognized as a resource that could attract tourism, it seems, in the same way that they have been in other Gulf states. Yeah, it's unusual um, because I do think we are missing on an opportunity. Um, people really love forts. <laughs> they visit them um, very frequently. You can see that success um, in our neighbors. And I've heard people say that, you know, if you're going to the beach, you know, you're going to the beach and there happens to be a fort. Uh, but people go to New Orleans, you know? Um, people travel in the area all from across the planet. Um, so I don't think the argument that we don't have sandy white, you know, white sand beaches, uh, and that's why our forts aren't um, made into national parks or active state parks. Um, it's, it's not a good reasoning. Um, people do come to Louisiana, people love it. Um, and I think that if we just put money and attention on the forts, um, they could be, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, they could be um, a real asset to our tourist industry. Yeah, and certainly, you know, get people out of the downtown core yeah. area for a day to spend some money in Plaquemine or spend some money in, you know, New Orleans East. To, yeah. Could yeah, and I think, you know, heading down to Fort Jackson, you know, how many tourists get to see um, wetlands? The drive there is beautiful. Um, you can keep going past the fort um, to the end of the road, really, um, and see amazing things. Uh, so I, I think that they could, they could be a really successful sort of tool in Louisiana's um, tourism kit, but one day. So if people who are watching want to uh, make an attempt to go see one or more of these for themselves, what, what recommendations do you have in terms of being safe, being practical, and maybe where to start? Um, yeah, so because none of them are officially open to the public, um, it is hard to encourage people um, to go there. Uh, several are visible um, from the water, uh, mm -hmm. from publicly accessible waterways. So you can paddle out to Fort Pike, perfectly safe. Um, you can paddle to Macomb. Uh, technically, you can paddle to Livingston. Uh, you might want to boat with a motor, though. Um, and you can paddle out to Proctor. So if you wanted to see the forts in a safe way, definitely, um, you know, take a kayak out. Um, but I'm, I'm very hesitant to encourage any sort of interaction with the forts beyond that. Um, mostly because, you know, they are not necessarily safe for people. And I would hate for someone to inadvertently cause damage um, to one of the forts. Yeah. Um, was their use uh, in the past sort of recreationally a source of damage? Do you know? Um, well, I say that because um, the trip that I took to Fort Massachusetts, I watched a visitor climb the brick wall. Uh, yeah. Just, I mean, the bricks are very soft um, from all that efflorescence. Um, and so in many places they've spalled away, um, allowing footholds. And he, he climbed 10 or 15 feet up and I could see the powder of the bricks coming off where his feet were. And I thought, what in the world would make anyone do such a thing? But I, it happens. Um, and so I would say that, you know, given the state of their bricks and mortar, climbing around on them or near them or anything like that is just, it's just unwise. Um, oh, I'm actually reminded you can still drive out to Fort Jackson and walk around the outworks. 
Okay. So you can see it. Um, you can see the moat. Um, it's usually full. And you can, last time I was there, you could actually walk the, um, what would have been the drawbridge. Now it's a permanent bridge and, and look in. Um, you can't go in. Um, and again, I would be as safe as possible, but it is one that you can drive to and walk around rather than needing to take a kayak. Okay. That's great. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, I don't want to take up too much more of your time or the audience's time, but um, I really appreciate your effort to do this, Lindsay. And I want to once again, thank Andrew for um, lending us those drone videos and letting us integrate those. Um, and so the, the last question I'll ask um, you has to do with sort of documenting these forts. Um, obviously there's a lot of kind of change over time to document, especially in terms of the wetlands loss, but right. also in terms of the use and that'll continue going on. So, um, you know, what efforts are underway or would you like to see underway to document um, these forts? Um, yeah, so my worst case scenario recommendation in my thesis was to document them all as comprehensively as possible and prepare to lose them. Um, obviously, I would really rather not lose them, but I think documentation is always good, no matter what the future holds for a building or structure. Um, there has been HABS documentation of several of the forts. Um, I know Pike was documented Proctor was, um, I believe Jackson, but that may be inaccurate. Um, but what I think is exciting is that technology is letting us move past um, the sort of tedious um, activity of hand drafting or basing things off photographs. We can laser scan now. Um, it is relatively quick and relatively inexpensive compared to previous documentation techniques. And it can take into account changes in um, the structure based on um, whether the water has gotten higher, whether it has slipped deeper um, on a foundation um, skew, whether it's starting to lean one way or another. Um, and you're able to compare that over time. So if we could bring in um, the special cameras that do the laser scans um, on a somewhat regular basis. And that is, you know, it could be every five or 10 years. It doesn't have to happen every six months or something uh, crazy. But if we scanned the forts with any sort of regularity and then use that data to find out where problems are getting worse, where things are not quite as bad, um, not only would we have a comprehensive scan of each fort um, so we would know exactly what they looked like should they be lost um, we would have enough information to go in with that strategic hands-on preservation and fix what is in most dire need of being fixed um, so in the long run it could save money uh, because rather than doing you know uh, backfill on the entire structure with that structural foam you could say like, oh gosh, the, the southeast bastion is falling at a rate that is unstoppable. It needs to weigh less um, and go ahead and take off only a tiny bit of the budget and fix that. Um, so, you know, technologically modern scans um, and documentation is really, really what the forts uh, need moving forward. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Sure, thank you. Today. Thank you everyone for watching, Andrew, for letting us use uh, that footage, um, which I'm sure folks can find on the internet if they look around. And I'll just um, close by again, thanking PRC members for making this possible with their memberships and remind everyone that you can go to PRCNO and read Lindsay's